Our next speaker, Mr. Wolf Goodman, who is known to many of you, was born in Toronto, was called to the Bar of Ontario in 1949, and appointed a Queen's Council in 1968. He pursued graduate studies many years after, or for many years after his call to the Bar, and was awarded the degree of Doctor Juris in 1976. Wolf has been a lecturer in the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto on Accounting and Law from 1961 to 1969, and in estate planning since 1969. He was a governor of the Canadian Tax Foundation from 1973 to 1975, and all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the very extensive writings that Wolf has done on the subjects of taxation and estate planning for many years. Mr. Wolf Goodman. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, in preparing the material for this lecture, I was struck by the fact that there is a great deal of first-rate writing on the subject of deferred income plans. And it would be adding unnecessarily to the volume of printed material if I were to simply to recap material which is available in much better form elsewhere. And therefore, what I propose to do today is to talk about a few areas of interest which are relatively new or have special significance for us. There will be a few other areas which are dealt with in the printed material, but in no sense will even the printed material attempt to be a comprehensive discussion, similar, for example, to the work that Arthur Drage did in 1976 in his book on deferred income plans. Any library will give you very complete summaries of RRSPs, registered pension plans, ROSPs, deferred profit sharing plans, and so forth, covering all of the highly technical points with which we're concerned. I'd like, however, to begin by asking, why aren't you saving to the maximum possible extent through an RRSP? The advantages, quite simply, are enormous. The most persuasive argument I can make is to per compare two individuals, both in a 50% tax bracket, one of whom uses an RRSP and the other does not. Take the, the one with the RRSP puts $1,000 of before-tax income into his RRSP, and in 20 years, let's assume that this accumulates at 12% interest, and it accumulates to $10,286, almost 11-fold. Now, when he withdraws this amount, of course, he pays tax at 50%, and he winds up with $5,143 on his original $1,000 investment. The one without the RRSP has to pay $500 in taxes on his $1,000 of income, and he therefore has only $500 to invest. If he invests also for 20 years at 12%, he has to pay income tax currently on the income which he is receiving on his investment, and therefore his money actually accumulates at only 6% per annum, net after tax. It amounts to only $1,631 at the end of 20 years, less than 32% of the after-tax amount accumulated by the one with the RRSP. Now, of course, this example is likely to actually to understate the true advantage, since many individuals who save through RRSPs will be in lower tax brackets in the years in which they withdraw funds from their RRSPs. And if that is the case, then the advantages are, of course, even greater. However, RRSPs today are not equally satisfactory vehicles for all forms of investment. Quite the contrary. In particular, they are poor ways to invest in common stocks, and for two reasons. First of all, as you know, if an individual holds common stocks personally, 
he benefits from the dividend tax credit. Very roughly, it means for every $1,000 of dividend income he receives, he's treated for income tax purposes as though he received $1,500 of gross income on which $500 tax has already been paid on his behalf. As a result, speaking roughly still, a taxpayer in the 33% tax bracket has no additional tax to pay. One in a 50% tax bracket has $250 <clears throat> to pay on a $1,000 dividend, and one in a 60% bracket has $400 tax to pay on a $1,000 dividend. Now, the reduction in the effective tax rate on the dividend is very dramatic, as we well know. In fact, of course, the calculations are a little bit more complicated. One must deal separately with federal and provincial taxes. An individual in a 39% federal tax bracket who receives a dividend of $1,000 pays tax, gross tax, of 39% on $1,500. And that amounts to $585, but then he is entitled to a dividend tax credit equal to 25% of the grossed up amount, or $375, his net tax payable to the federal government is therefore $210. And his provincial tax is simply 44% of his federal tax, 92.40. He pays just a shade over $300, $302.40 on a dividend of $1,000. His after-tax return is therefore just a little under $700, which is just a little short, in this case, of 70% of the amount of the dividend. If such an individual were to invest in an interest-bearing security, he would have to earn $1,591.24, almost 60% more, in order to have the same amount, $697.60, in after-tax income. Clearly, the dividend tax credit is of enormous benefit to us. Unfortunately, however, the very considerable tax advantage through the DTC is not available to the person who uses his RRSP to buy shares. He still benefits from the tax deferral, but all the monies withdrawn from his RRSP will be fully taxable, even though they consist in part of dividends. The second disadvantage is that if an individual invests personally in common stocks and realizes a capital gain, then one half of that capital gain only is includable in income and the other half escapes taxation. However, if the individual invests in common stocks through his RRSP, his capital gains will be fully taxable upon withdrawal. Now, of course, this isn't an argument against investment in common stocks. It's merely one against doing so through RRSPs. If an individual is investing in both common stocks and interest-bearing securities, then it makes sense for him to invest in the common stocks personally and in the income-bearing securities through his RRSP. That is the law as it stands now. But Mr. Crosby, our former Minister of Finance, recognized that there was something wrong with the tax system, which gave greater tax incentives to conservative investments in interest-bearing securities than to somewhat riskier investments in Canadian common stocks. In his notorious budget of December 11th, 1979, Mr. Crosby therefore proposed some major changes relating to RRSPs. Dealing with the way they would be taxed on withdrawal on maturity of the plan, and I emphasize on maturity of the plan and not earlier withdrawal. First of all, one half of net capital gains accruing after 1979 in an RRSP would be exempt from tax on withdrawal. This means that an individual will pay no more in taxes when he invests in common stocks through his RRSP than when he invests personally. And in addition, of course, he still enjoys the benefit of tax deferral. Secondly, one half of dividends received after 1979 from listed Canadian common shares would also be exempt 
from tax on withdrawal. Now here the effect of the proposal in the budget depends on the individual's tax bracket. It isn't as simple as the capital gain situation. For taxpayers in 36 percent and lower federal tax brackets, that's all but the top two brackets, it means that the rate of tax on withdrawals of dividends from an RRSP will be higher than the tax rate on dividends received directly from personal investment in common stocks. However, individuals in the top two tax brackets, 39 percent and 43 percent federal brackets, will be considerably better off, particularly those in the top bracket. An individual in the top bracket of 43 percent, which represents a combined federal and provincial rate of 61.92 percent, pays almost 39 percent in tax on dividends that he receives personally. On the other hand, under Mr. Crosby's proposal, where the dividends pass through an RRSP, he would pay only 31 percent, an eight percentage point spread. Will the Liberals reintroduce this budget resolution? I wish I knew. Let me talk also about a use of deferred profit sharing plans which isn't completely obvious. Many law firms and other firms of professionals have established office management corporations which are the tenants or owners of their office space, which hire all non-professional employees, purchase all the supplies and equipment, and provide a service <coughs> to the professional firm in return for a fee which produces a profit for the corporation. And that profit, as you know, is taxed at corporate rates. This was particularly favorable before 1980, since such corporations enjoyed the benefit of the small business deduction, reducing their total federal and provincial tax rates to about 25 percent. And when this was compared with personal tax rates going up to 61.92 percent, the advantage of diverting professional income into an office management corporation was pretty obvious. It was so obvious, in fact, that the la last Liberal budget on November 16, 1978, proposed that the benefit of the small business deduction be denied completely to such office management corporations. And you remember the flurry of excitement about that. When the Conservatives were elected in May of 1979, one of their first acts was to modify this Liberal budget proposal, and instead Parliament enacted an intermediate tax rate of about 33 and a third percent applicable inter alia to office management corporations. The new intermediate rate still represents a substantial tax advantage for people in higher tax brackets at most professional firms. There's still good reason to use an office management corporation. The problem, however, is that we're now getting much further away from 1971 Many such office management corporations have been operating since that time. They're beginning to bump up against the cumulative business limit of $750,000. And unless they do something, they will no longer be entitled to the benefit of the lower tax rate, whether 25 percent or 33 and a third percent. And the usual remedy for this, of course, is to pay dividends. However, if the shares of the Office Management Corporation are owned by professionals in high tax brackets, they'll not be very happy about receiving dividends and paying the taxes on them. Those professionals whose spouses are in lower tax brackets and whose spouses own the shares of these Office Management Corporations, of course, may be in a somewhat better position. Another approach to this problem is possible, namely, to try to soak up some of the corporation's income in a deferred income plan. Here the logical plan is a deferred profit sharing plan, qualifying under Section 147 of the Income Tax Act. It isn't very complicated, and it doesn't interfere with the ability of the professionals to make full contributions into their RRSPs. The Office Management Corporation may contribute up to $3,500 per employee per year 
into its DPSP. It needn't do so for all of its employees, and presumably it will do so only for the partners of the professional firm. The catch is that the amount the corporation can contribute on behalf of any individual is limited to 20% of his salary. In order to pay $3,500 into a DPSP, the management corporation has to pay a salary of $17,500 to the individual. Now, it may be quite worthwhile to have the office management corporation pay each partner in the, cor in the professional firm a salary of $17,500. And such a salary can, of course, be taken into account in computing the profit distributions of the firm. The real concern is that these salaries may not be fully deductible unless it can be shown that the recipients are actually doing work for the management corporation and that the amount which they receive doesn't exceed reasonable remuneration. In most firms, this shouldn't present a problem, I suggest, because most partners do, in fact, participate in one way or another in the activities of the office management corporation, whether he serves, he or she serves on the personnel committee, the library committee, or even the art committee. <laughs> Those those of you who um, are familiar with Goodman and Carr will appreciate the reference there. It shouldn't be too difficult to establish that the salaries are proper business expenses. Since the partners will be paying taxes on these salaries, I suggest that it's unlikely that Revenue Canada will seek to disallow them. Then, if this hurdle can be overcome, a firm of six partners can put $21,000 a year into a DPSP in addition to $33,000 a year into RRSPs, a total of $54,000 or $9,000 per partner. That's pretty good. Fairly recently, ladies and gentlemen, fairly recently, there's been a novel use of registered retirement savings plans involving an investment trust which was formed for investment in rental real estate. Now, persons who invest in this trust can acquire units of two distinct classes. One of these classes is intended for direct investment by the individual, and the other for investment by his self-administered registered retirement savings plan. The number of units of the first class for personal investment can't exceed the number of units issued by the trust of the second class for RSPs. Now, the trust, as I say, owns rental real estate. It divides the rental income pro rata among all the unit holders without distinction between the two classes of, of uh, units. However, the trust allocates the whole benefit of capital cost allowances to the first class of units held by individuals. And it does so under subsection 104.16, which gives a trustee power to allocate capital cost allowances among income beneficiaries. Now, obviously, since an RRSP is exempt from income tax while it is operating, there is no purpose served in reducing its income for tax purposes by allocating any capital cost allowances to it. The trust, therefore, allocates the whole benefit of these allowances to the individuals. And in those circumstances, they get twice as much tax shelter, to use a term I hate, tax shelter for their rental income than they would get if they were simply to invest directly in rental real estate. The arrangement is sufficiently attractive that it's of some significance that Revenue Canada declined to issue an advance income tax ruling. Now, in accordance with the usual rules regarding taxation of trusts, sale of real estate by the trust at a price in excess of its undepreciated capital cost will lead to recapture of capital cost allowances. And that recapture takes place in the trust not in the hands of the unit holders. And because of this situation, 
it's necessary for this real estate investment trust to have rather elaborate provisions that when an individual sells his interest in units of the trust, he has to make a contribution to a fund held by the trust for the purpose of meeting the trust's potential income tax liability, which will arise in the event of sale of real estate and recapture capital cost allowances. This is a disadvantage, but the overall arrangement, I suggest, has a great deal of merit as a tax minimization device. Let me talk about unregistered pension plans. Until recently, Revenue Canada took the position that contributions by employers into pension plans which were not registered with Revenue Canada were not deductible as expenses for income tax purposes. You might well ask, why not? Common sense tells you that current contributions to a pension plan are simply ordinary operating expenses of an employer which ought to be deductible under general principles of income tax law. In fact, in the leading English case dealing with a pension plan, Atherton and British Insulated and Helsby Cables, 1925 House of Lords decision, there is a suggestion to that effect. Now, that case dealt with an established company which set up a new pension plan for the benefit of its employees. And in order to provide reasonable pensions for employees who already had long service with the company, the company provided a large lump sum past service contribution as seed money for the plan. It claimed the right to deduct that amount as an expense for income tax purposes. The revenue disagreed. The House of Lords also disagreed and held that this was a capital outlay. Indeed, the case is one of the leading decisions on the distinction between capital outlays and deductible business expenses. However, there are several comments in the case, in the speeches of the law lords, which make it clear that they accept it as a matter of course that ordinary contributions by an employer into a pension plan in respect of his employee's current services were deductible as ordinary operating expenses. To my surprise, Revenue Canada was able to persuade Mr. Fordham of the Tax Appeal Board in a case decided in 1969 that an employer's contributions into an unregistered pension plan were not deductible. The reasoning seemed shaky, but the case is Payton's and Baldwin's Limited in 1969, and it went against the taxpayer. The case involved an English company which operated in Canada through a branch here and which made payments into an English pension plan on behalf of some of its key Canadian employees. These payments were disallowed as expenses. The disallowance was confirmed by the board. The case didn't go any further. Nonetheless, I still believe that under current law, payments by an employer into an unregistered pension plan in respect of current service are fully deductible. Very few people ventured into this area in the light of Revenue Canada's opposition and the Paytons and Baldwin's case. Until last summer, when Mr. D.L.H. Davidson, an assistant deputy minister of Revenue Canada, spoke about the matter. And what he had to say, I will quote specifically, the department has recently re received many requests from taxpayers who have been implementing NRPPs, that's non-registered pension plans, for various reasons as to the treatment for tax purposes of payments made into such plans. Contributions made by an employer to such a trustee plan in accordance with actuarial requirements and the appropriate legislative authority are permitted as a deduction to him for tax purposes provided that he has no reversionary rights to the amounts transferred into the plan. The deduction for such contributions is permitted in the year in which they're paid or become payable, and as such, enter into the calculation of business income within the provisions of subsection 9.1 of the Act. And if he goes on to say that as and when payments are received out of the plan, they are then taxable. 
Mr. Davidson's remarks caused a flood of inquiries about the plan. Indeed, it caused major excitement among tax practitioners. Of course, there are major disadvantages in an unregistered pension plan. First, employees' contributions are not deductible at all. And secondly, the income of the plan is taxable currently, since it's not exempt under 149.10, which protects registered pension plans from current taxation. However, if only the employer is contributing to the pension plan, the fact that the employee isn't permitted a deduction really doesn't make any difference. And in addition, if the funds of the plan are invested in deferred annuities for the benefit of the, re the employee whose retirement is to be provided for, these don't yield any income for tax purposes until the employee reaches retirement age. And at that time, the income would be paid out currently to the employee so that the unregistered pension plan avoids paying any income tax either during the period of the employee's employment or during his retirement. So much interest was created by Mr. Davidson's remarks last June that Mr. C.W. Maver, another senior departmental official, was supposed to elaborate on the remarks in a speech in Edmonton last October. However, what he had to say was rather different. He said, quote, I regret to have to say that I'm unable to reward you with further information on NRPPs. The whole subject is under study, and in the circumstances, revenue will not be issuing either advance rulings or opinions until further notice. The second shoe, ladies and gentlemen, fell on December 11, 1979, when the federal budget included a resolution dealing with unregistered employee benefit plans. Resolution number 10 says, A, a deduction be allowed in respect of reasonable employer payments made after December 11, 1979 to or under an unregistered employee benefit plan only at the time the amount vests irrevocably in the employee, and B, any benefit vesting irrevocably in or received by a taxpayer at any time after December 11, 1979, pursuant to any such plan, be included in computing his income at that time." End quote. That's rather onerous. But even if this budget resolution is enacted, I suggest to you that it won't necessarily be the end of unregistered pension plans. Employers with very large capital cost allowances, real estate development companies frequently, or depletion allowances, is it permissible to mention that oil companies don't pay very much in taxes? These companies may not be unhappy to wait until the employee retires before claiming a deduction for income tax purposes for their contributions into an unregistered pension plan. If so, the plan can be so structured that the benefits do not vest irrevocably in the employee until he reaches retirement age. Consulting contracts are a common enough method of dealing with this. In addition, Nonprofit institutions, which aren't concerned about the deductibility of payments, can also make effective use of unregistered plans. And that means that it is possible to set up plans which are not on a non-discriminatory basis, or to put it coldly, which are discriminating in favor of senior executives of the company in a manner which would not be permitted for a registered pension plan. Now, Terry Sweeney was kind enough to mention briefly registered retirement income plans, income funds, I should say, RIFs, R-R-I-F. These, I suggest, are for the individuals who are not really interested in receiving an annuity on the maturity of their registered retirement savings plans. If they have sufficient income from other sources, they want to have their RRSP funds sheltered from tax as long as possible. And therefore, they're likely to be attracted 
to the use <coughs> excuse me, of registered retirement income funds. The operation of such a fund can be illustrated by assuming that an individual has now reached the age of 70 years. He's getting close to 71, at which time his RRSP must mature and it must be converted into an appropriate income vehicle. Previously, only a life annuity, now also an annuity certain, or a RIF. If he were to purchase a term annuity to age 90, he could expect to receive about $85.14 a year for every $1,000 in his RRSP, based on an interest rate of 10% per year. These rates, of course, fluctuate considerably. The annuity, of course, would be taxed in the year of receipt. However, if he were to transfer his RRSP funds into a RIF, he would receive gradually increasing payments, starting in the first year with 1 20th of the amount in the plan, 1 19th of the value at the beginning of the second year, 1 18th of the value at the beginning of the third year, and so forth, down to 1 half of the value at the beginning of the 19th year, and whatever remains in the plan must be paid out in the 20th year. Now, since the value of the property in the fund will be increased each year by the untaxed earnings of the fund, the RIF will provide substantially larger payments in the later years than in the earlier years, thereby achieving a considerable degree of tax deferral for taxpayers who don't really wish to receive sums any earlier than necessary. An illustration of the advantage that deferral brings is that if we were to assume that an individual deposited $1,000 on December 31st, 1979 in a RIF, with payouts on December 31st of each subsequent year for 20 years, and with the income earned by the RIF at 10% per annum, the same figure I used before, the first year's payments would be $55 as compared with $85 in the term annuity for 20 years, and that annual payment would increase by 10% a year until it reached a figure of $336.37 in the 20th year. Obviously, there is a very considerable advantage here, as these figures will testify. Okay. Terry Sweeney has also referred to the fact that RRSPs are now a vehicle into which farmers can transfer capital gains on the sale of farmland. Farmers have, of course, always been the darlings of the Canadian tax system. It's hardly surprising that Mr. Crosby provided another tax advantage for them in budget resolution number 25. Up to $100,000 of any taxable capital gain realized by a full-time farmer on an arm's length disposition after December 11th, 1979, of Canadian farmland or shares in a qualified farm corporation will qualify for a rollover, that is a tax deductible payment into an RRSP once in the farmer's lifetime. The farmland has to have been used for at least 15 of the previous 20 years in a qualified farming business carried on by him or the corporation. It's difficult to discover why this salutary arrangement is made available only for farmers and not for retiring businessmen who sell their businesses. Perhaps this may be included in a future budget. The last area I'd like to discuss, ladies and gentlemen, although it's not the only additional area dealt with in my paper, is becoming a non-resident and saving taxes on one's RRSP. There's been a fair amount written about this, but really the tax advantages are so considerable that it's worth talking about again. When a Canadian resident becomes a non-resident, Section 48 of the Income Tax Act deems him to have disposed of most of his property at its fair market value 
unless he elects to defer his tax liability under paragraph 48.1c and he furnishes appropriate security for the tax. However, there are two exceptions to this rule. One deals with taxable Canadian property, which is a term of art, and we needn't deal with that one now. And the other deals with payments listed in paragraph 48.1b, which include payments out of registered retirement savings plans and deferred profit sharing plans. Now, payments out of these plans are subject to 25% withholding tax when paid to a non-resident under paragraph 212.1 L and M of the Income Tax Act. However, if the individual has become a Canadian, I'm sorry, has become a U.S. resident, these withholding tax requirements are overridden by Article 6A of the Canada-U.S. Tax Convention. And that provides an exemption for pensions and life annuities. These terms are defined in paragraphs 7 and 8 of the Protocol to the Convention. So Canada does not impose any tax on these payments made by the former Canadian resident, I'm sorry, made by the, the RRSP to the former Canadian resident, now a resident of the United States. And in the United States, only the interest element of the annuity payments is subject to tax. The capital element is considered to consist of the whole amount accumulated in the DPSP or the Registered Retirement Savings Plan up to the time the annuity commences to be paid. As a result, the whole of the interest accumulated in the plan prior to the commencement of annuity payments escapes taxation in either country under the current convention. And Canada and the United States have been renegotiating their convention ever since 1972. We don't seem to be much closer to the actual signature, actual signing of a convention. When it does come, however, we can expect that this rather astonishing loophole will be eliminated. Now, some tax advisors, pardon? <laughs> That's possible. Mind you. Some tax advisors are concerned that the statement which I've made concerning the American tax position in respect of interest accumulated in the RRSP while the individual was resident in Canada may not be entirely correct. They are concerned that this accumulated interest when it begins to be paid out in the form of an annuity to the U.S. resident may possibly be taxed as interest by the U.S. government. These advisors suggest that out of an abundance of caution it may be desirable to transfer the funds from an old RRSP into a new one just before one uses the funds to buy an annuity. And that would seem to solve the problem because then the full amount that's in the new RRSP, which is used to buy the annuity, would appear to be regarded as capital for U.S. tax purposes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's one last area I'd like to mention to you just briefly, and that is the so-called tax-deductible mortgage. Here, Although I think I'm reasonably active in tax practice, I must confess I've never seen it. Nevertheless, the, the attractiveness of the plan, which has been discussed in many places, requires that I at least mention it to you. The best description of it, I think, is from Arthur Drache's book of 1976 on deferred income plans and tax planning. And he points out, that the plan is based on the ability of a taxpayer to deduct his interest on money borrowed to purchase an RRSP, but his inability to deduct interest on money borrowed by way of a mortgage on his house. That is assuming that the mortgage on the house is, uh, represents financing for the purchase of the house. In the example that Mr. Drage uses, there's a $60,000 mortgage on the house, and the individual 
we'll be depositing $5,500 a year into our RRSP. And instead of putting $5,500 of his income into his RRSP, he puts it into a term deposit. He then borrows the money for the deposit of $5,500 into his RRSP. The term deposit can serve as security for his borrowing. And at the end of five years, he'd have a debt to the bank in respect to borrowings for his RRSP of $27,500 plus interest, of course. And he also has $27,500 plus interest in term deposits. And he then uses the $27,500 of term deposit to reduce the mortgage by that amount. Then comes the crucial step. He gets a new mortgage for $60,000. That is, he increases it by $27,500. The extra $27,500 is used to repay the bank in respect of the RRSP loan. The effect of this, of using this 27.5 for this purpose renders the interest paid in respect of the money tax deductible since it was used to retire a loan where the monies were originally borrowed for a deductible purpose. That is to gain or produce income from the RRSP. And this procedure can be repeated until the whole amount of the mortgage has been completely discharged. As I say, I have yet to see the plan but a number of people have published descriptions of it. There seems no reason in principle why it shouldn't work. And uh, I derive a certain amount of comfort from the fact that uh, Revenue Canada, which is usually such a stickler for detail in insisting on a tracing of borrowed monies to ensure that the interest which is claimed as a deduction represents interest on monies borrowed to earn income is in this sense being hoisted a little bit on its own petard. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.